Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Glenn Lawrence, preferably known and better off known as Oz Warrior, motivational speaker. And I am here today on the Prosperity Show to talk to you about how you can become a warrior in your life too, despite all your adversities and negative past. Let's fire it up. Thank you, Prosper. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Online Prosperity Show. And today we've got the ultimate warrior himself, Glenn. How are you doing, hey, man? Man, I'm really, I'm really great today. It's a, it's, it's a beautiful day. My first podcast, I'm absolutely stoked. Um, bad weather outside, awesome vibe inside. So yeah, I'm ready to do this, Prosper. How are you? Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time. I know um, you could have been out there doing heroic activities which you always are doing um you know and saving lives and helping people that are going through traumas through your motivational speaking now ladies and gentlemen if you're watching this show right now um we've just pulled in glenn aussie lawrence now glenn is a very good friend of mine we've known each other for quite a while online and today we've just decided you know it was time that we got um you know word out there about what he does and who he helps and how he actually got his name um the ultimate warrior okay so there's quite a lot of stuff that happens in people's lives there's quite a lot of stuff that we go through as entrepreneurs um and as humans you know in our quest to have a happier existence it, it's not all you know all straight and easy or you know like uh, eating ice cream and um, these things that happen that shape us that make us become who we then become so without these adversities we wouldn't know the success in life without all these challenges we wouldn't know how it is to um you know fail or to actually go through stuff that you can overcome in life so that's the reason why we've brought in the motivational speaker glenn to enlighten us a little bit about what he does and his journey and also <laughs> brag a little bit about the people he's met along the way and how he is actually helping people like you and me to be, do, and have a life that's worth, uh, um, you know, that's uh, of a great, of a happier existence. Now, Glenn, did I say any of that right? Yep. Uh, everything's perfectly fine. I would, I'd probably be uh, more inclined to go for the Oz Warrior. Um, uh, the Ultimate Warrior was uh, a male role model to me and, uh, you know, just a huge icon and a huge hero and a huge loss to me a couple of years ago. So, um, if, yeah, if you want, we'll go uh, Oz Warrior um, and uh, that is the name of the business and stuff. So, um, yeah, everything else is perfect. perfect. Great. Great stuff. Let's, let's actually really unpack that. Why the, why the warrior? Why Australia? What, what is it about your name and what is it about what, it, what you do? Okay, the Oz Warrior come together, believe it or not, back in uh, 2012, uh, January 25th. It was the day before Australia Day and I uh, was watching a, some old WWF or World Wrestling Federation as it was back then. Uh, Blu-rays of my, my hero and icon, the ultimate warrior himself, and to later become a motivational speaker in his, the last few years of his life really inspired me. Um, <clears throat> but I was watching some of them and just, I went to sleep and uh, for some reason, uh, I, I know it sounds, uh, it, it's, it's not really a big thing, but I had this, these two words come together in my sleep and that was Oz and warrior. And I woke up with those words on the tip of my tongue and I thought, oh, it seems weird that that's what come to mind. <clears throat> now, at the time, I had a gentleman living with us and uh, he was affiliated with uh, some bike groups and the Vlad laws were in and unfortunately he was doing some really, really bad stuff at the time to himself uh, in regards to substance abuse. And uh, that particular day on Australia Day, he was racing around to my house and he was all frantic because he couldn't uh, get his high. And um, amongst him carrying on the way he was and everything and his, um, his, his attitude and mood at the time uh, was really a real bad vibe around the house. And those words were still there on my tongue. And I thought, you know, while he's like this, I'm going to do uh, something. I'm going to create a page on Facebook because the few weeks before it, I had been writing some really long positive stuff that when I read back the next day, it was like, wow, did I really write that? And uh, I don't even know where it come from. You know, it was just powerful, positive stuff. And I was getting some great feedback. So while this adversity was going on in my house with this gentleman that we would 
were not able to get rid of, I created the page Oz Warrior and I thought I'm just going to write inspirational and motivational stuff and in good time I'll start telling my story as well. So that's how Oz Warrior come together as a Facebook page. It wouldn't be until about two years later on when I decided that, um, you know what, I'm going to take this to the next level. I'm going to rent, uh, hire out a hall, uh, a small function room and get all my family and friends in there. It'll be a ticketed event. And I'd get up there for an hour and a half to two hours and tell my story uh, of my life. And uh, my events, uh, they still are called uh, Survivor to Warrior. And what that is, is the first hour of the show was called Survivor. And that's where I tell my story from when I was four years old and my biological father left uh, right up until uh, 1988 when I was actually heavily sexually abused. I, I, I go through those kind of details. Um, I talk about uh, the imprisonment and the whole process I went through with the uh, juvenile aid where I had to make you know, my claims and go to court and actually have this gentleman imprisoned. Um, how I dealt with his release. And, uh, you know, lots of other things that have got along the way. Uh, I was a kid who started. I was a B several times. I've had uh, alcohol problems back uh, when I was 18 to 20. They're blurry years for me. Um, I can't even say good memories from the parties because uh, it was, uh, I just don't have no uh, memories of it. But, you know, I went through that. Uh, there was a period of my life where I was homeless, sleeping in my own car. That, uh, you know, I, I just didn't have a place to stay for a good month or two. Um, right up until, uh, you know, now being happily married, uh, have been for 13 years as of two days ago, um, and uh, having uh, four beautiful kids, one, my youngest, uh, being a neurofibromatosis uh, sufferer, sufferer herself. She actually gets up and she talks in my events now, and she has a little five-minute little spurt up there, which is really inspirational. But, you know, I sort of discuss that inspiration uh, sorry, the, the, the survivor part of my event is all about my stories, all my hurdles. And then we take a little bit of a break and then we go to the warrior side. And that's where I really get to fire up and pump up and really throw out the motivation and, you know, the mindset you've got to have when you wake up every morning and, um, you know, just believing in yourself enough to realize who you are and getting up to that before you feed it to ground every morning, just getting there pumped up and saying, right, you know, like I'll wake up every morning and I've got this eye open, this one's still shut. Before I pick the sleepy dust, before I'm even thinking about coffee or checking Facebook, I'm putting my feet on the ground as a warrior. And when I feet, my feet hit, come off the ground in the morning and I'm in bed, um, you know, they still are the warrior. I have vivid dreams about such phenomenal changes I'm going to make in my world, the world around me. That, that, that's because my mindset, and that's what I try and put into people at these events as well, is... Um, you know, you, you can't just sort of spend an hour saying you're going to be someone great. You've actually got to step into that, that suit. You've got to put that war paint on your face as my hero, the ultimate warrior did. And, um, you know, realizing who you are from the minute you wake up to when you go to sleep. And uh, that, that, that's what I do in the, uh, the warrior part of my event, Saliva the Warrior. Um, so that gives a bit of my background. That gives a breakdown of my events. And uh, they obviously close off with my favorite part, which is normally questions and answers, where we get in depth about certain things. And we also get really, really positive and fired up about other things as well. So, um, you know, I've had uh, 16 different surgeries in my life on various parts of my body, from um, hernias, uh, shoulder recons. Uh, I've had eight facial surgeries alone. Um, yeah, I've, I've, uh, you know, I've been through a lot of adversities. Uh, as I said, you know, I had a bad stutter. I'm not even supposed to be able to motivational speak. I'm supposed to be that little fat kid that got bullied heavily at school because he had a stutter and everything. But, you know, here I am today at 40 years old, hiring function rooms and, you know, firing up 40, 50, 60 people, whatever's coming along to that event and uh, having to some degree of impact on their life from either quitting smoke and alcohol, becoming better parents, uh, all that kind of stuff. So um, I hope that sort of... Uh, I know it's a bit chop and chop and connect, but that's a sort of breakdown uh, of my timeline of life from the little four-year-old kid when my father left to now doing motivational speaking. So, thank you so much, uh, Glenn, for that. It does sound like a lot of heavy things that you've had to carry throughout the forty years of your existence, but. In this world, we're here to live, we're here to learn, and we're here to contribute. So now Definitely. you would have lived through those adversities, but in those adversities, you have picked up a few lessons 
that you are now contributing to the rest of humanity. And for that, I absolutely thank you for that. And congratulations um, for you you and Joyce. Um, 13 13 years of marriage, that is also something that's of a phenomenon. And um, I suppose you've got all the four beautiful kids that you've managed to um, raise through this all these adversities and yes. um you know it, it takes something to be able to sit here and talk and you know really elaborate and be articulate about such heavy things that one would have gone through because like i said you, you're here to leave you're here to learn and here to contribute now you would have had lessons that you learned and you said you started off all of these adversities when you were four years old Can you just walk us through some of the stuff that would have been happening when other kids would have been going to kindergarten and enjoying their childhood? What was, what was happening with the little Aussie oil oil warrior then? Um, Well, things were quite lucid before then. Um, I do know we're living at the Gold Coast and uh, we were in a housing commission place. Um, It was a fibro, fibro place down there. I think we were near Burley Heads or something like that or Southport. And uh, we lived in a really poor area down there. Obviously, you know, it's Housing Commission. My mum did the best she could. Uh, my biological father worked for the council and uh, he was 10 years older than what mum was. He was a full-blown alcoholic. And uh, I don't recall him ever being abusive towards me uh, in any sort of uh, verbal, physical, and definitely not any sexual sense. Um, I just remember when he left and this is my first memory of life. You know, my seed cracked. My, my seed busted open and broke the surface in life of all my memories my first recollection of life is me going to my biological father and saying daddy are you okay and he was actually storming around the house and uh, he replied back to me i've had a gut full of this i'm leaving uh reason being is because mom had my mom had found out that once again he had been caught out on a uh well, there were magazines back then you could advertise that you were sort of single but doing things secretly behind your wife's back and everything and uh, he had a history of cracking onto my mum's younger sisters and stuff. And uh, yeah, mum had finally had enough and he had to leave. So my first memories of life was asking dad, where are you going? And he said, I've had a gut full of this. And he was packing his bags and I never saw him again until a year later on when he took me for a weekend where I was locked in a room with the TV and lots of lollies. I don't remember having any dinners or any time with him. He was addicted to listening to the horses racing on his wireless as he called it back then. Um, <clears throat> and the Greyhounds and uh, AFL, Rugby League. He was one of those people who are like, kids are there to be, I think it's uh, to be seen, not to be heard sort of philosophy. Well, his was, kids are not there to be seen or heard. And yeah, we are just regularly, um, you know, for the couple of weekends he did take me, which was literally two weekends. Um, that was, you know, we were just, you know, my, me and my sister were just put into a room and just told, you know, be quiet. I'm listening to the races while he drank four X tallies continuously all day and night. So um, that's how my life, that's my earliest setup of life. It wasn't no family holidays to the Great Barrier Reef and a flashy hotel and seeing dolphins and feeding turtles, that kind of stuff. My first memory of life is my dad leaving. And uh, he really stayed pretty much out of my life up until 2004 when my wife and I got married. I've only seen him once before then. Oh, understandable. Um, that, that is remarkable there, Glenn, because from that early age, you, you would have started to see all the inequalities or you know, all the bad things that you could possibly be exposed to in life and all the qualities yeah. that any kid that's around that age are not even supposed to have been seeing and yet you yes came out of all of that and you went on and became a really good dad to kimberly and the other kids what sort of yep kimberly hayden Grace, and Aaliyah, yep understandable now you've seen all the bad stuff firsthand i just want to ask a question about the people now that you hang around with because it takes away the trust that you have in humanity and in sort of a father figure or male people around you, what sort of qualities do you look for in people that you hang out with now? Um, I actually like a vast variety of people. There was, uh, there's an old saying that, you know, people who are, you know, not for you are against you. And I've actually found 
um, that sometimes having the negative people, but you know, at a distance, are a constant reminder of what you don't want to be and what you don't want to end up in like, uh, like in life. And I'm talking everything from, um, you know, I don't judge by appearance. I never will, but just, you know, I've got friends who drink every weekend, mow the yard and do nothing but eat, um, you know, just take away and they've got to have their roast, that kind of stuff. And they've got the typical mid, you know, mid age male, you know, spread around the stomach, that kind of stuff. So they're a constant reminder of me, you know, how to look after myself inside because, let's you know we've got to admit it that's where all goodness comes from it's what you feed into yourself exuberates out so you know i'm pretty 90, 90 i'd say 95 percent of the time I'm conscious about what i eat and drink so I'm, nobody wants to see a really 300 pound motivational speaker because they're not looking after themselves so i've got to look after myself too so um so yeah I, you know I, I like to have some people in a far distance corner to remind me what i don't want to be like and you know how i you know i don't want my life to turn out like but uh you know, my, my, my friends that I've got, believe it or not, I would honestly say 70% of them would actually be females. I, I can honestly say throughout my life, um, I have had trust issues with males in general, um, even to the point of what I went through when, as a kid, you know, even going to the toilet's been hard. You know, I don't like, uh, you know, being on other males. Uh, if I can go a bit deep here, you know, but, you know, just being there vulnerable while someone else is there, you know, doing their thing, it would take me to a really bad place. So, um, you know, I, I've, I've trusted in females a lot because females never disappointed me. Like my sister is such a beautiful, strong girl and she's been through hell herself. And then my mom was the one who pretty much had to do all the raising of me. So henceforth, I'd rather do the dishes than mow the yard. But, you know, I've got some really phenomenal people in my circle as well, such as yourself. And I've got some really high up celebrities. I've got some, um, you know, the number one real estate coach in the country, Glenn Twiddle, and uh, his beautiful girlfriend, Naomi. Um, you know, they're... You know, they, they just brought on Schwarzenegger over last year and I'm shaking his hand. You know, I've got some really great people in my pocket and some brilliant, absolutely brilliant musicians from the 1990s. If you remember songs like Slave to the Music 24-7, I talk to them almost daily. You know, DJ Sash, who was huge in the 2000s, like, you know, him and I correspond. I've even got Roy from Rednecks, if you remember that song, Cotton Eye Joe. And, well, and yeah. that, like, you know, Roy's a, he's in that band with the guy after really long dreads. You know, we correspond as well, you know, and, uh, you know, Every once a month, I like to go to a friend's house and shoot some pool and have a couple of jacks. Yes, uh, I am human. And, uh, you know, you do need your downtime. And I consider that to be like a, you know, somewhat of a reward. But I don't go there to, you know, come home and, you know, sunrise and be absolutely plastered. You know, it's to go to have a few drinks, have a good time and just sort of be a man for a day and not be warrior and not be Glenn, but just go there and shoot stick and not have to worry about life and not have to talk about work. And uh, then, of course, you know, like I'm a family man, so, you know, Easily, most of my time, if not all of it, is spent going to dinners and movies and, you know, all the, all the amazing things that, you know, families are supposed to do that I never got as a kid. Once again, I do the opposite too. So kids first. My daughter, you know, as I said, got special needs. And I've actually found a lot of inspiration as Disney Pixar movies, you know, like uh, even Frozen. You know, so if she says, Dad, let's watch Frozen, I'm like, well, this is great because it's going to fuel me up and I get to sit next to my daughter for an hour and 20 minutes, which I don't often get that kind of time to do. I get inspired, watch her smile, watch her cry, but sit next to her on the couch and just enjoy that actual moment that I'm in. Like, wow, what a beautiful thing that is to, you know, be able to do that. I don't, I never watched any movies with my dad. You know, he was a warmonger. He loved, uh, he was racist. You know, he loved watching, you know, as you know, he, I, I'm not saying just, you know, as a good thing, but, you know, he'd sit there and watch, you know, Tour of Duty and he would make references to like, yeah, look at the Yanks and the Aussies shoot down the, um, I, I don't even want to say it because it's bad, but, you know, the, he'd say, you know, things like slanty-eyed Fs, you know, and that's, that's what I grew up in with my, with my stepfather, you know, so, um, and he was accepted as that particular kind of person, but um, it turns out he wasn't anyway. But anyway, um, yeah, my circle's just phenomenal. You know, I, I spend a lot of time on social media, uh, once a year, I get to hang out with Eric Thomas for a little bit, like the number one, well, the most watched motivational speaker in the world. Like, it's just crazy. You know, I could be sitting behind a screen sharing, you know, silly memes all day about stuff. But here I am shaking hands with, you know, people who shake hands with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sly Stallone and Richard Branson. And, you know, these are people in my circle that I get to, you know, hang with. And, you know, I've got my football friends, you know, my football family as well at Logan Brothers down there at Logan Central. Um you know, I get to go there every weekend while my son plays, you know, he does his thing. And, uh, you know, they're just typical, you know, uh, volunteers who coach, who do touch judges, who like to have a Corona or something after each game or after a big Saturday. Um, I used to coach down there. I'm thinking of going back to it next year as well. 
Uh, once again, we're help, um, helping out the di women's division to grow and prosper a little bit. And, um, you know, th there's, there's lots of little circles. And each one I get something from, even if it's a bad circle that I have to correspond with maybe once a year or because they might be family members that I've had to keep the peace for a Christmas function or whatever, I can still look at them after 12 months and go, just if things get really bad, this is what will happen if I keep that door open, you know what I mean? So um, I try and stick with the positive people, the giving people, the aspiring, the aspiring, motivated, uh, all, all the good people have something good to give with money aside, you know? So it's, it's about the positive messages and the positive vibe you get from people. So um, yeah, I've got a lot of different circles in each one for different particular reasons, but I've had to do that because I don't want Mr. Negative hanging with my Mr. Positives because Mr. Positive might not want to affiliate with me no more, you know what I mean? Because... They might think I'm affiliated with Mr. Drunk over here and overweight and womanizer, you know, and then I've got my workmates as well who are all just, I don't want to be here. I hate this job, that kind of stuff. And you know, I'm like, well, you know, there's a door open when you walked in here every single shift and your decisions in life have brought you here. So I've got that negative vibe as well. So, um, and you know, it's good to have that as well. You know, that place isn't where I'm going to be for the rest of my life. Definitely not. You know, I'm going to be traveling as Southeast Queensland, then Queensland, then Australia, then hopefully the world. Uh, doing motivational speaking and inspiring through my life events and everything. So, um, you know, I know my days are numbered there. So I rock up so every Sunday night when I start my shift because, as you know, I work graveyard shift. I rock up every night and I'm singing and dancing all night and I'm singing and dancing right up till Friday morning when my week is end and people still keep scratching their head. Why do you keep doing that? And I'm like, well, you know, because I know my days are numbered here, man, because I'm just so motivated outside of here. And, uh, you know, uh, music has been some of the best thera therapy you can possibly imagine. Like, I've even caught you out sometime before you started a uh, Facebook Live and you've got the pen in your mouth and you're tapping away and you're dancing. Like, music's, music's my therapy, you know what I mean? And these discussions as well. So, um, yeah, it's just a, it, it's a vast variety of friends. And, you know, there are times when I get down and I'm going, like, I might have to go over to this person's place to lift me up. You know, I have no problems with asking for help subliminally or directly. But, um, yeah, I think it's good to have a good variety. Uh, How do you say, let's have a lot, of a lot of different fruit in my bowl if you could, you know, and some days I feel like this and sometimes I feel like that. So, yeah, it's good to have a variety. I can't sit here and say, you know, every single person I'm around is a millionaire, successful, motivated, doing things. I need those other people to remind me, don't keep staying on this particular path because you'll end up like this at the end of the week or the end of the month or the end of the year or the end of your life. You know, and then there's, uh, as I said, there's people here that are, you know, I shake hands with people who pay Arnold Schwartz and get to come over and talk at their events. Like, this wouldn't have happened if I sat back and been depressed. Glenn, I'm living in my past. Glenn, I haven't dealt with my past sort of thing. You know what I mean? So it's amazing what happens when you open up the doors of like, you know, I still can survive this and I can put my wall paint on every morning and I can warrior up and I can go out there and do my thing. So, yeah, um, probably went off track there a bit, man, but I just get fired up. You know, I was hitting that warrior mode when I'm talking about this stuff because it's always try and end it on a positive so it's good to have a lot of different people in your circle i believe good variety understandable well thank you so much for that because now now you know you've taken us from the time when you had your first memory when you actually remember how it was all going and you know with dad sitting there not really caring about you guys and you know yep. having the philosophy that you know kids are just meant to be heard and i mean seen not heard and which is a very play, bad place to be because as kids are growing, they want to thrive in a, um, you know, a, a positive environment. They, that's when they're learning the most things. That's when they are, you know, you know, finding out what the environment is all like. And you never had that opportunity. Now, you now have all these people and responsibility. And like you say, you also do have, um, you know, a little girl that you are looking for looking after that has special needs if you sort yeah. of wanted to create now an environment that's totally opposite from what your dad would have created an environment where motivation can thrive now and also we might have people that are in the audience right now that don't understand how then they can get out of that humdrum or conundrum of where they could be and not realizing that they're actually crippling their growth and those that are around them by being negative and stuff. What is the first thing that you would do if you were to create an environment, you know, where motivation can actually thrive? Um, well, it's a, it's a really good question, but uh, you know, a tricky one. I, I sort of, for me, uh, when it, when it comes to the kids, I like to get on their level. 
you know, it, it's never, it's never dad and daughter or dad and son. You know, I, even when I, I coach the little kids, I get down on my knees. So I'm at eye level when I talk to them. So I'm at their level. And, um, I think it's important to be their friends and, um, you know, uh, if they start experiencing things that not even necessarily that I can relate to, but because of my experience of being able to pull people out of, um, you know, pulling people out of the mud, people I don't even know that I've met on a one-on-one life coaching session or something like that. Um, you know, it's been able to sort of relate to their problem in some way or another. And, uh, you know, been able to turn into a positive and say, well, look, I understand that your, your mum, uh, she might've, uh, you know, abused you at some stage when you were a kid. I want you to know that I went through that with my dad as well. And then, you know, go through the steps of how I come out of that. When it comes to children, you've got to use small words and you've got to make it short because I've got a attention span shorter than what a three minute pitch would be in a business room. So, um, you know, when, when it comes to kids, you've sort of got to say, you know, like, you know, I, I've been there with you and what I want you to do is, you know, just pretty much come up with a simple solution or a simple resolution for them. And uh, usually when it comes to my kids anyway, they really stick to it. But when it comes to other people's kids, it, it, is, it is a bit hard, I've got to admit. And I guess some adults too, because they will tell you what's going on, but then you find out the second side of the story. You know, you find out that, uh, you know, you might be helping a certain kid and talking to them and trying to, you know, uh, and encourage them to study because their grades are slipping. But then you find out because they're wagging, you know, because they're the most disruptive kid in the classroom. You know, they're the ones who are bullying and that kind of stuff. And you don't hear that because the parents want to only tell you the good parts, but they're a kid to support me. <clears throat> then there are some legit victims of, uh, you know, severe, severely bad circumstances such as severe bullying or abuse at home that they're exposed to and everything. So, you know, I, I use my experiences to inspire and motivate and definitely motivate. You know, I like to sort of give them a projection of what their, you know, uh, their futures could turn into if they stay on a particular track, if it's destructive or negative and uh, how it can turn around even if, you know, you're a positive person and, you know, you take bad things, you know, sort of go, go through all the scenarios uh, with the older age children as to what can go right and what can go wrong in life. But yeah, I, I think, you know, motivation is one of those things we don't get at school. We're sort of programmed and treated like a computer, getting information punched into. I was never really, I could have been good at school. I chose not to. Um, that was on me. But, you know, motivation definitely does help to remind them of, you know, what potential lies ahead in their future. You know, you talk to little Johnny and say, what do you want to be when you're old? And he's, he's seven years old. And he says, I want to be a policeman. You know, and that's when you can sort of say, well, gee, guys, policemen, you know, they get to they get to help a lot of people out, you know, and you get to talk to them on a policeman's, you know, I've got so I know some policemen who are very close to our family. And, uh, you know, I can talk to them about, um, you know, you get to, it, it's more than just catching bad guys and, and all that kind of stuff. You get to go into some really bad situations and save lives and save little children and stuff, but this is the path you have to stay on because if you go out there and you do drugs and, you know, you, uh, you set fires to things or you become a bully, that kind of stuff, and you have to go to that, really bad place called the courthouse that could actually destroy that dream it doesn't mean your life is over you can still become something phenomenal out of this and use it as a lesson but that dream could be particularly over if you go on a negative course so that's where the motivation comes in i believe motivation is today to the future inspiration is past to present you know what i mean so um yeah i use my experiences for that as being a victim of bullying i've never been a bully myself um i i, I just don't have a I have a lot of tough bones in my body, but I don't have a direct abusive one in my body. I don't even really like arguing too much, except from with my wife, but that's what they're supposed to do. That's what couples are supposed to do, you know? So, um, so yeah, that, I think that that's how motivation definitely does work when it comes to, uh, you know, to helping that children is to rem- let them see the future because I'm, I know I'm living in the same moment as what they are, but I am 30 years in the future of you. And I know where I would be if I hadn't have been on these paths too as a, as a child or, you know, spent two years drinking a nightclub in two years of my life. I can't remember. Had I worked in and started a trade, you know, it could be a carpenter now or whatever. I might not be a motivational speaker, but you know what? I could own a house. I could own a boat and I could own a couple of cars and have some nice things and, um, and whatnot. So, um, you know, I think motivation's universal for everybody on any path, any direction, even if you're, you know, you already are a millionaire. You might want to become a billionaire. So motivation is going to kick in, you know, to the kid who's getting these rocks thrown, thrown at him at school, to the kid who is throwing the rocks. Motivation can definitely change everybody and everything, you know, from a particular age when they can understand the concept of the future and firing them up and giving them a vision of what could happen to you positively in 15 years' time when you graduate from college and you want to go out there and catch the bad guys and pull cats out of trees and, uh, you know, save kids from, um, 
you know, bad car accidents and bad relationships that they might be in with their parents or whatever. So um, saving runaway kids, you know, uh, help from the homeless, whatever it might be. So, yeah, motivation is definitely good, but motivation is a projection of today and into the future for, for everybody. So I understand. that answers the question. Oh, yeah, no, definitely does. Thank you so much. And viewers, if you're watching this, um, we're talking to Glenn Ozzy Lawrence, the Ozzy warrior, who's telling us a bit of, um, of his story and his journey up until now. He's helping uh, people in and around Australia and also, um, you know, overseas to have a happier existence um, and, you know, literally telling us that where you are is temporary. What you could be going through, whatever adversities, you can turn that around in order for you to have a happier existence. And as entrepreneurs, we might be going through a lot in life and just thinking to ourselves, how can I overcome things like this? That's the reason why we bring in experts like Glenn that have been through the worst of the things that you could think of to actually just lighten your burdens and actually go on with your life so that you actually can have a business that's profitable and enjoyable. I'm not taking um, what you've been through lightly. I'm not insulting your intelligence, but sometimes when you notice that you do have some sort of a problem, um, somebody has had it worse off than you and they are still at the other side, you know, of the, of the line. Um, happier, smiling, and actually willing to lend a hand to show you that you know this is, um, you know this 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 is how you too can overcome these problems. Now, Glenn, going back to you a little bit, you've been through quite a lot. You've been homeless. You've been um, through alcohol problems. Obviously, that was your way of trying to you know erase um, that part of your life. And you know your your dad left at a very early age. You've had. Um, was it yeah. 16 surgeries, eight of which were on your face? Um, you would have just yeah. given up on life. but And you would have feelings of animosity towards right about everything else. And yet you're clean shaven right now. You're sitting with us without yelling or screaming and really being passionate about what it is that you're doing, which I really applaud you for. How do you keep your feelings from actually clouding your decision making um, you know, process in, in today's, um, you know, humdrum of life? Well, I guess um, having these opportunities where you can have a uh, small pocket of time where you can talk about something from the past, uh, they always seem to fall into the right place when things are boiling to a point where, you know, it might be on your mind at some point, but there, there's always something that pops up where I get a chance to talk about it. And this is my counsel, you know, I don't take any depressants and any anxiety tablets and you know all that kind of stuff i've always been strong enough to not have to worry about the prescription things i found talking to be the best therapy out there and music gets me through a lot but um in essence um yeah i, I really do think that that is the the nucleus of being able to fix everything is just being able to open up about these things because it isn't so much just about you being able to talk about it even though that is the core um that, that is the, the primary you know, reason why you might want to do it, but you just don't know who you could be inspiring else out there or making them um, you know, hear your story and going, oh, well, you know what, if you can do it, I can too. Even if it is just waking up and going, you know, I'm going to smell the roses tomorrow and I'm going to give my kids an extra big cuddle. Like, that can be the most amazing thing. Ergo, say, um, I'm going to go out there and make a million dollars. It's, you know, it's not about that. It's just about being a greater human being, which is what I'm all about. So, um, you know, I think that, yeah, that, that's definitely how you know things have really helped me the most is being able to talk through, you know, talk through all the, uh, you know, when it does manifest, talking about it, even if it's not manifesting, if it's you know, if I get the opportunity to talk about it, I, I love talking about it. It uh, it helps me, it helps other people and stuff. Um, yeah, I, I think that's that's really. Uh, I really, I really do think that that's honestly the, the you know, what what works best for me. Great. Um, Great. I, different strokes for different folks you know some people are on bad things you know but you know i just think you know if you can just sort of have a little bit of positive a little bit of light in the future people like myself and there's always going to be someone in everybody's circle like even the homeless people there's some real positive people amongst the homeless people uh, out there living in underneath the bridges in brisbane city you know who are out there still positive who will talk to the next homeless person next to them who's negative and try to inspire them you know if you just wake up tomorrow and just decide i'm gonna take some steps out of here I'm going to start, um, you know, uh, doing what I can to get myself out of situations because I go back to Eric Thomas again, like he lived in abandoned, abandoned buildings to get away from an abusive father. 
um, for many years living out of trash cans, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, now he's the world's most watched motivational speaker. Like he was homeless and he is an African American from America who has to, you know, grow up with racism and stuff. Um, he's a little bit overweight himself too, you know, so he's had to fight all the adversities. Now, if someone like that can do it, um, then anybody here with a mobile device able to watch this video in the future, who's already miles ahead of where Eric Thomas was at that time, should be able to become a decent human being. So, um, yeah, I, I, you know, I think, I think that that's what it is. You know, it's, it's I think that's where it's at, to be honest with you. That, that's where it's all at. You know? um, Great so. stuff. So obviously growing up and thank you so much for your input so far. This is, this is remarkable. Growing up, you did not have a father figure. You did not have a role model or somebody you could, you know, learn off from and you literally had to survive, which is what your, the name of your program is survivor. And, you know, going through all of that, um, what, what, what has actually influenced you the most or who has been your greatest influence? Cause you keep talking about Eric Thomas, you keep talking about, um, you know, your, your name is warrior. And you also uh, mentioned Arnold Schwarzenegger in between who has actually influenced you the most to now be, do and have, um, you know, such a happier existence, um, of which you're sharing with us today. Oh, mate, look, um, you know, I loved the wrestles growing up because I always thought, you know, the, the absence of having a, of having a male role model and being bullied so heavily at school, I, like, I was really bashed, like, really, really badly a lot of times at school. Many concussions, many broken noses, which led to uh, two of the surgeries I had. It's still a big nose, but it used to be so deviated, it caused apnea, which is why I needed all those other surgeries. So I had, I couldn't sleep because of the bullying, literally, physically, because of the damage that was done to my face. But um. You know, I, I used to I used to love the WWF. I used to love, you know, people like, you know, Ultimate Warrior and all those muscled up guys. And I always used to dream it, like like not a wake dream, but sleep. And I'd wake up and go, I just wish for the right reasons I had Ultimate Warrior into my bed to walk me to school to take care of these bullies. And uh, because nobody wants to mess with a six foot four dude who's, you know, 280 pounds of pure ripped muscle, you know, and he's except for put a bit more clothes on in the school grounds, you know. But um and I always pictured and envisioned that, and that vision sort of kept me, you know, will he be there tomorrow morning? I knew it wouldn't be, but I, that's, that's all I had to cling to, you know? So, um, you know, I, I had the wrestlers, you know, the bigger, the scarier, the muscle, you know, the, the, the better they inspired me, which led to me doing some weights later on in life as well. Um, but I'm too banged up from a young age to even, you know, become a wrestler. I'd, you know, first body slam, I think I'd be, uh, you know, it'd be my funeral a week later on. Um, that'd be probably for my as midget wrestler and females too, so... Um, but no, I, you know, as the wrestlers growing up, you know, that I wanted to sort of be like, or I, um, you know, wanted to sort of be scary. So people had stopped picking on me, that kind of stuff. So they inspired me to want to be someone I wasn't, but I enjoyed the sport of fake wrestling where people legit were fighting, but not legit getting hurt. You know what I mean? Because I was so used to being hurt. Um, and then along in my teens come the man, uh, you know, crikey, Mr. Steve Owen come along and, uh, you know, he made me, uh, I used to you know, go camping and that kind of stuff later on in life and uh, go to the beach and people would be fishing and drinking, whatever it is. I'm out in the bush catching snakes and that kind of stuff. And I was doing my thing and, you know, digging up crabs and taking photographs of them and stuff. And that sort of led me to think, you know, oh, I'm going to start reading a bit more on these guys. When I got bullied at school to avoid being bullied, I hid out in the library and read a lot of books and they were all this wildlife, Australian wildlife orientated. And the match just come in when, uh, you know, Steve Owen come into, you know, uh, television and become famous and everything and i thought you know this this guy's not intelligent but i can relate to him for that because i'm not you know he doesn't get into the scientific words and he's not out in the middle of the bush in a fancy suit using big words to describe uh cockatoo you know so you know he's out there crikey look at this it's a cockatoo get a load of this terry grab a photo and i'm going to try and catch her you know and uh, i thought you know that's exactly what i'm like you know and i could just relate to the dude so much so and then he became a father and i was like just in tears so many times looking at all these beautiful photos of Steve holding up Bindi and and and, uh, and and Robin in his hands and you know the things he did with them traveling the world catching and saving our wildlife and all overseas as well and and I thought wow this is a great dad and I was I was jealous I was crying all the time and I said you know I'm just I'm going to be that dad you know I'm going to go catch my snakes and stuff but I'm going to be the guy who's on Facebook and I'm going to guy the guy's going to have a thousand photos of you know me and my kids together and uh and embracing each other and just loving each other and going out there and, you know, doing some crazy adventurous things out of the, out of the norm. 
So Steve Owen was a massive inspiration as a, as I didn't know how to be a dad prosper. I had no idea how to do it, how to be a dad. I knew how not to be a dad. I knew how not to be there. I knew how to be an alcoholic. I, I knew how to not be faithful to my wife. You know, that, that, that's what I knew about being a dad, you know, and that kids were not allowed in the lounge room when the TV was on and I was awake, drunk or sober. You know, women were there to cook. Women were there to, um, they weren't allowed to work. You know, they had to set the table and make sure the knife and fork were placed precision next to, pl- you know, to the plate. You know, and the fork had to be on one side and there had to be an open toolie on the table. That, that's all I knew about being a dad. I had no clue, Prosper. So I've had to take it in from people who I could relate to because then I could take the information. If I can't relate to people, I'm still stubborn. I'm a Taurus at the end of the day. So if I can't relate to the person, I can't take any of your qualities. Like if uh, you know, Gary V, great guy, but I can't relate to him. I hate his... Um, uh, I don't hate him. He's a great guy, but I hate his, uh, what's the word for it? It's not ego, but his whole go forth, uh, his whole in your face. I can't stand that. You know, once again, it goes back to being, a, I need you to back off a little bit and talk to me. Stop yelling at me. What did I do wrong? You know, and, um, you know, but, you know, Eric Thomas is different. He's intense. So, you know, I had a uh, ultimate warrior at, you know, as a kid um, who I wanted to be like, where I wished was my father when I was a kid. Um, Steve Owen educated me in so many ways. So he's a massive, massive inspiration. Those two are still my two key people in my life who uh, inspire me outside of family. And then, yeah, of course, there's, a, I, I can't say his name enough, Dr. Eric Thomas. He is now a doctor. Um, he, uh, you know, getting to meet him so many times and giving me and uh, my kids when I've taken them to see him uh, when he comes over here. And, uh, you know, he gives us a lot of time a day, you know, um, shake hands, we hug, photographs, it all looks good for Facebook. But what you don't see is that, you know, he'll sit down for 10 minutes and, you know, talk talk to me. This is a guy who's got 100 million views on a YouTube video and I'm here renting a house in Crestmead in Logan City where houses are getting broken into all the time. I've got a, a leaky roof up here. I'm not saying I'm living in squalor. Like, you know, I'm actually living good, but we've been flooding for two weeks, but just goes back from a really bad thunderstorm from years ago. Like, I'm renting a house, working in a factory, folding up metal parts, you know, um, who's trying to get a dream together. And I'm shaking hands with people like Eric Thomas, who talked to the Detroit Lions before games. You know, he does the NBA. He goes to, you know, the, these big meetings once a year where the, the top 10 entrepreneurs in the world, like the guy going to cope and the, you know, the, the world's biggest names. And he has to go in there and motivate them. And I'm shaking his hand. And he's talking to me. I mean, like, wow, you know, so how could I not be inspired by someone who has come from nothing to something, you know? So, um, and he's just so humble about it. He never brings money into the, in, into the whole thing. And that's what I love about him. He talks about his story. And, you know, when his wife nearly left him, when he started going on the road all the time and he's traveling around, like these are obstacles I'm going to have to go through uh, because I don't want to sit back, just keep, you know, renting the function hall around the corner and, you know, getting people in there and talking to the local schools, whatever it might be. It's about, um, you know, when I do travel around the, you know, the, the country or the world, and I might be gone weeks at a time, you know, my wife may have to, you know, she may go through these struggles because, you know, she's a little bit older than me and she's got diabetes and a bad heart and everything. She's got dramas of her own. And if I'm not here for those things, you know, what emotions is she going through? She might not be as strong as what I am. So I'm going like, okay, is this, could this potentially happen to me? And I'm like, well, watching what Eric Thomas went through because I follow him so attentively, I'll know how to deal with that situation. It's a lot more than roses and sorries. Um, you know, your dream must roll on. But there comes a point where you're going to have to be like, okay, all right, you have to come with me. You did a Disneyland thing. I'll be over here in, you know, Las Vegas, wherever, doing my events. But you have to come with me so you can still be together, try and work together. But the dream must roll on. Family first, obviously. But you've got to try and make those two things work, which is what he started doing until his wife got multiple sclerosis. where She was sort of grounded for a while there as well. So, um, you know, once again, he, he, he puts out, you know, what the dramas are and, um, all the issues and stuff that he's gone through. And these are all things that I can definitely relate to. So um, Eric Thomas, Steve Owen, Ultimate Warrior, and definitely my daughter. You know, she's just, uh, she's the epitome of what a female warrioress is all about. You know, 12 years old with all those problems, man. And, um, you know, she can get up there and talk at my events for 10 minutes, a story she wrote, you know, about something that might or might not have happened, but she's just brilliant. She's up there talking in front of all those people with me, you know, like, how can I not be inspired by that? And she's got a condition, as I said, called neurofibromatosis. And what that means is later on in life, um, she is most likely going to come out in tumors from head to toe. Um, you might've seen some YouTube videos where some tumors can actually be like a 10 kilo tumor on one side of the face where the bottom lip is down here. And 
Uh, the eye is all dragged down and everything. That's what's on her cards at the moment. And she's already got seven small uh, marble-sized tumors, one on her spine, one on her foot. She's got some on her legs and uh, some other places as well, uh, one in her groin. So, um, you know, that's why she's looking down. And uh, she has a speech impediment. And uh, she's at a grade three, grade two level of uh, reading, maths, English, all that kind of stuff. But there she's up there at my events talking. I'm like, well, here I am able-bodied, you know, without the tumors, without the speech impediment anymore. Um, you know, a, a normal person, you know, in, in good shape and everything with a positive message. And here she is with all these adversities that she was born with. Now, she wasn't a victim of any circumstance like I was. She was born with these problems. And she gets up there and talks, and I'm like, well, how can I not put that as the highest pedestal? You know, how can I not make her the, the you know, at the, at the actual apex of all the people that I admire and look up to, family, friends, all that kind of stuff, and heroes and heroines and that kind of stuff. How can I not put someone like that at the very top? You know, I went through dramas. She was born with one that's not curable. You know, so she has to be. You know, she's got to be. And um, given the fact she won't be able to work a normal nine to five later on in life, I can only sit back and say that, um, you know, I hope, hope to God that, you know, when things take, you know, blow up for me, that she'll be part of my team, either as someone who just introduces me on stage or whatever, or, um, you know, maybe she can become a bit of a side speaker, you know, doing her thing with me. I know she's not going to be capable of doing a nine to five job at a normal factory, flipping burgers, whatever it might be. So it's up to me now to create something that she can just fall into and make it her niche throughout her life. So, um, you know, up, up until when she can do it and make money, whatnot. So, um, yeah, so she's definitely, you know, my greatest, my greatest hero. She's, she's definitely my greatest influence and my, the one that inspires me the most. She's why I get up in the morning and both feet at the ground and I put the wall paint on because she's waking up with all these problems and I'm waking up just going, oh, my back's a bit sore from the factory, you know, and she's waking up with tumors and stuff. So how can I not, you know, look up to her even though she's, you know, shorter than me just, but, you know, she's, uh, she's the ultimate hero to me. She's the ultimate warrioress to me. So, yeah, they're, they're, they're my heroes. And then, you know, I've got people like yourself, Glenn Twiddle, um, you know, and a few other people that I get to correspond with quite regularly in any sense. We can muck around as we do on Facebook. Sometimes we clown around and then sometimes we're real serious. But, you know, we, we catch what we can of each other's uh, output out there. You know, so, you know, I consider, you know, people like yourself as a great influence. Like, you give me this opportunity to talk. I'll be set for Christmas now. I don't need to worry about my past because you've given me this opportunity uh, to uh, not vent. Vent is, I think, is a bad word, but um, this opportunity to open up to inspire some people. And I feel good about this conversation. I'm not going to go to bed later on and cry because I remembered what happened in the past. No way, man. No way. I've, I've just fueled some, someone out there is going to get something from this. So, um, you know, so people like yourself, you know, I, I'd, I'd definitely consider as, uh, you know, a, a, an inspiration in my life. And uh, then there's, you know, all the music celebrities, because some of them have risen and some of them have fallen and risen again and still touring around the world. And some have fallen by the wayside. And Like just the other night, I was talking to Alana Miles. Uh, I'm not sure if you remember her from 1990. Her biggest hit was a song called uh, Black Velvet. You know, I'm corresponding with her, you know, and I've seen how she's had some physical uh, issues that have grounded her. And she just does her little studio things and sells a couple of hundred records every 10 years when she wants to release a record. But... Um, you know, I've seen her sort of plummet and negativity gets to her and the world of, you know, how everything gets to them and everything. And some people, you know, they just get better with it, like Beyonce's and Lady Gaga's and that kind of thing. And some people have let it crush them. So I still get inspiration from them too. Um, I'm stoked, don't get me wrong, that someone like that gives me time of day. Like she was winning Grammys in 1990. But now she's trying to sell them for money. You know, like, um, you know, you get a lot from that. You really do. But, um always be grateful for you know talking to someone who i you know i've got to admit she was going to be my first my first ever wife unfortunately i couldn't get to america and i was only 14 years old at the time but <laughs> yeah she was uh, you know it's great to get that correspondence so yeah, but yeah no it's really good you know there's a lot of people on social media that i haven't met personally but you know really inspiring people and you know really helped me along i'll take a bit from everybody i'll take a bit from the homeless because he reminds me how we got homeless and i'll take a lot from the filthy rich out there because i know what to do if i ever choose to become someone who wants to become filthy rich i do but with an abundance of just joy happiness and giving what i can in the opportunity in the time that i'm currently in you know so. wow thank you so much well you have given a great deal today uh glenn and i really really appreciate you for your story 
your courage to actually tell us um, what was going on with you at that particular time and just your essence, your presence today really got me thinking that there's a lot of things that we do take for granted. I do have a daughter um, at, at the time of recording this video, she's two years old and I do try my best to actually, you know, be there for her and make sure that she does also end up having, you know, a, a life that's of a happier existence and coming from another dad and yeah. you saying that you are out there creating something that your daughter is also going to be a part of that is inspirational in its yeah. own right because yes i hadn't thought that far ahead of creating something that my daughter will be involved in you know so thank you thank you for lighting up that spark inside of me so i'm going to go out there and create and for whoever has been watching obviously this has been an emotional roller coaster of um you know, of a show. If you hadn't gotten um, a, a box of tissues on the side, I don't know who the hell you are because this is such a touching, um, you know, episode where we are um, having Glenn pulling back the curtain on how he grew up in a dysfunctional home, but now has become the father and also going to be a business person that is going to be helping thousands, if not millions of men, women, and children out there that do not have a motivated, um, you know, a motivational influence in their life or a father figure. So I would like to thank you, Glenn, on behalf of the rest of humankind you. for what you have just shared with us today and what you are about to embark on. And those that are going to be, um, you know, following your journey and your story, how else can people get, um, um, you know, in touch with you, Glenn, if people have been inspired by your message today? Okay, well, um, I, I can only direct them to one particular place, and that's my page, which is called Oz Warrior, um, Wildlife Warrior and Motivational Speaker. That's where it all started back then in uh, January 26, Australia Day, back in 2012. Uh, you'll see um, there's, there's some videos there. Uh, some of them, a couple of them I've actually broken down in really bad, like I've really, you know, cried. Um, so I, they're raw. I, I like to go out in nature as well. So I do a lot of them out there. At, uh, I've got a park just down the road here. It's just acres and acres of bushland. That's where I get the most amount of inspiration from. And I'll call them Ozvids. But apart from that, uh, I do share some memes now and again that I might pick up from Instagram or whatever that I find are actually going to be great. I don't just like throw stuff out there for the sake of keeping the page active. Um, and anything that's written and it's got, you know, the hashtag Ozwarrior underneath it, that's actually come from me. So uh, for uh, 1,200 days now at least i've been able to wake up and write something very positive um and original um at least you know it's been every day i've kept that page running and yeah at least you know it's maybe once maybe once a couple of weeks i can't i'm just too busy to get creative or think about something so you know i will go and share a meme or whatever but i write on it every day and have done so i've been able to dig for a little gold nugget every day not for me because i don't get paid for this you know i i, I I sometimes sit there for two hours trying to think, what can I give these people today? I don't know what they want, but where am I at? You know, I'm trying to put that into words and give it. So um, I hope that the people who do go to the page uh, actually uh, appreciate it there. Like I said, the videos are raw. I'm not in a studio with fancy cameras and fancy lighting, that kind of stuff. I'll be walking my walk and I'm sweating profusely and I haven't shaven for about a week. And I'm thinking, wow, that's great. There's a one minute video and I'm doing it and the camera's shaky and I'm sweating. But I'm telling you right now, everything I'm doing is from the heart and I'm not financially motivated on this particular journey right now. I do it because I actually want to give and because I've got the ability and the talent to put some great words together that I can turn into a fire for you or something that can um, help you in some way whatsoever. But I do it for free and it takes me a lot of time. But I just love giving it. So I hope that the people who do come to Oz Warrior Wildlife warrior and motivational speaker do get something out of it, but that's pretty much it. I don't have a website up yet. I have just yesterday ordered my first bit of merchandise, which will be coming in the form of silicon wristbands. So I'm getting a bunch of them done up. So that's going to make me cry when they come in because that's my dream that, you know, a bunch of people will be wearing, you know, like it wasn't supposed to happen. I'm rocking Steve Irwin ones and Australia Zoo ones and Batman ones, but now I'm going to be a, I'm going to have merchandise. It's great. So um i'll have a little shop up there eventually when the shirts get up there with uh, great shirts with positive quotes or like the ones that i've designed myself here the dream believe rise logo on it so yeah if you it's just a page you know i've got an instagram account but i use that just to clown around and just sort of be human for a while there 
Um, but yeah, check it out. Uh, or you can even just add me on my own personal profile, which is Glenn Aussie Lawrence. I'll happily pretty much accept people who have uh, mutual friends who want to connect for the right reasons and not try and sell stuff. I'm, I'm all down for that. Um, so yeah, if you're out there and you want to connect in, in either of those senses, fire away a like or fire away a uh, friend request and uh, we'll get chatting as fucking help you in some way as well too on a personal level. I'm, I'm all for it. I do it for free. I do it for free. You know, my events are free. Uh, the life coaching I do is free. I've got to get great before I can sort of put a dollar price on there. So um, until then, I need y'all to be my guinea pigs. So hit me up. <laughs> Understandable. Well, Glenn, I can't wait to get you all started with your, you know, endeavor and your journey. And thank you so much for your courage, your expertise, and your time today on the show. Um, while you were telling us your journey from where it all started and the things that you've gone through and what you are now doing for other people selflessly. Well, it's been a pleasure having you on the show today. And I wish you all the best and I can't wait to see you in the future going out there and doing what you absolutely love like you are right now. Thank you so much, Glenn. Thank you so much, Prosper. And thanks again for this opportunity to uh, have this, uh, is it classified as a podcast today? It's, uh, you know, absolutely phenomenal. Thank you so much. Glenn, you're amazing. Thank you.